The following program features archival footage from World War II. All of the images are real. Some are extremely graphic. Viewer discretion is advised. Normandy, France. Stretching for hundreds of miles, this beautiful coastline is about to become the setting for one of history's most epic battles. The concrete and guns of the formidable Atlantic Wall are all that stand between Adolf Hitler's continental empire and the Allies, determined to liberate Europe. One must never forget that the invasion of France in 1944 was the largest enterprise ever undertaken by human beings. There was the channel full of boats. And the skipper said, look, boys, we're making history. This is D-Day. In this film, we reveal how life was under Nazi occupation, the bravery of those who resisted it, and the heroic battle for freedom that begins on D-Day. Featuring newsreels of the time, rare and enhanced archive footage, and the testimonies of those who were there. This is World War II, witness to war. Paris, June 1940. It's been almost a year since war broke out, and the Nazis have conquered Western Europe with earth-shattering speed. Having successfully captured the French capital, Hitler poses before the Eiffel Tower, a chilling statement to the world. When the defeat of 1940 happened, I saw the Nazis arrive. That stirred in me a feeling of indignation and desire for freedom, because I didn't want to be invaded by Germans who would take our liberty. I wanted to be free. Although some are determined to fight on, newly appointed French Premier Marshal Philippe Pétain is not among them. He's resolved to make peace with Germany. Many French officers trusted Pétain. Pétain was an incredibly important and significant figure in the French army who had been an extraordinary, victorious leader during the First World War. But the terms of the armistice are onerous and harsh. France is divided in two. The north is placed under German rule and the south becomes a Nazi puppet state governed by Pétain from the town of Vichy. 40 million French people who put their hope in Pétain to bring the war to an end and bring their husbands, fathers home and do the best for France. Quite quickly, they realized that perhaps this great hero of the First World War wasn't going to represent their interests in the way they'd originally thought and it became increasingly clear that he was throwing in his lot with the Germans. And many people were very uneasy about this. For the French, it's a humiliating capitulation to their long-standing enemy. Some refuse to accept the indignity of living under German rule. Among them is a young general named Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle decided that he didn't want any part of it. And he left France and went to London. On the 18th of June, de Gaulle spoke on the BBC, encouraging those members of the French army who could make their way to join him, to carry on the battle against the Germans. De Gaulle's speech becomes a rallying cry for those who feel betrayed by Marshal Pétain and inspires the men and women who will later unite to form a resistance movement. My fiancé was killed in the war. We didn't want the Germans in our country. We wanted to stay French. So I got involved in the resistance. I started to resist by listening to the BBC. These defiant French civilians will become the Maquis, 
and the French Forces of the Interior, or FFI. June the 28th, 1940. In Britain, de Gaulle is officially recognized as the leader of the Free French. He forms a new French government in exile to work closely with Prime Minister Winston Churchill. It's a vital relationship that will provide Britain and its allies with invaluable intelligence from occupied France in the years to come. Vichy France, 1942. Life is becoming unbearable for those living under Nazi repression. As anti-Jewish legislation is passed, fear and paranoia are widespread. My parents lived every day with fear in their hearts. They were afraid they would be denounced as Jews. People didn't trust one another. The regime enforces more and more brutal measures. When in the summer of 1942, the French police began to round up the Jews, my family went into hiding. I saw the French police cars and French inspectors. They took a whole family originally from Lebanon. The mother, father, grandparents and the children, all taken. As the cruelty of the Nazi regime increases, French resistance activities build to a new high. In response, the milice, a Vichy paramilitary wing, is set up to hunt down resistors. Its members swear an oath to fight to the death against Jews, communists, and those loyal to Charles de Gaulle. I think that the milice, they were called, the Vichy active police who were really fighting the resistance were extremely nasty. One didn't want to get into their hands. They all arranged tortures and that sort of thing. They were convinced fascists. The Vichy became increasingly closely associated with Nazism and the Nazi occupation. By 1943, everyone was united in recognizing that the Vichy government also had to be thrown out and that the resistance had to rid the mainland of the Nazis. But the French people living under Nazi rule aren't alone in their determination to drive the Germans out. Tehran, Iran, November 1943. Allied leaders Joseph Stalin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill meet to discuss the war effort. Stalin is desperate to open up a second front in the West to take some pressure off his Red Army in the East. Churchill and Roosevelt both agree that now's the time to plan for an invasion of France. Their target date is summer 1944. In order to prepare for the Allied invasion of Europe, it was necessary to bring British Special Forces people to operate against the Germans in rear areas in order to supplement and support the Allied invasion. Agents from the Special Operations Executive, the SOE, are sent into France to make contact with the resistance and sabotage German transport and communications. What started anyway was training people all over Normandy small groups in farms, how to make explosive plastic charges, bombs, and using pistols and using stun guns and uh, being able to gather information. The men and women of the resistance risk their lives and those of their loved ones as they fight back against the Germans. I was a liaison agent. I was a courier. My home was a drop-off point. I recruited people. You needed all sorts of people in the resistance. Priests, communists, it wasn't politics, it was patriotism. By the time we get to 1944, there is really a jigsaw of movements and networks of the resistance, some of which is above ground, much of it is clandestine, waiting for the word from London, from the Allies, that D-Day was in the offing. And that momentous day is about to arrive. Portsmouth, England, spring 1944. 
A command team led by American General Dwight D. Eisenhower is planning Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of France. An invasion force of unprecedented size is being mobilized across southern England. 1.4 million American servicemen arrive to bolster British and Canadian forces. In the run-up to the invasion of France, D-Day, England became basically an armed camp. There were millions of soldiers, millions of American soldiers, Canadian soldiers, British soldiers, many of whom had not seen action. They'd been training and training and training for years, but they'd be waiting for this moment. The Allies add enormously to their air power, an incredible 12,000 aircraft to join a great armada of ships. British factories go into overdrive, and supplies flood across the Atlantic from North America. And grizzled civilian longshoremen worked the cranes and hooks that swung the martial wealth of the free world onto the soil of Britain. Here was Montana's copper, Australia's wheat, Pennsylvania's steel, Texas cattle, the nimble fingers of the women in the aircraft factories of California, the sweat and muscle of the Canadian mines. It would have been impossible to conceal the massive preparations for the Allied invasion of Europe in 1944. It was just too big. Too many Americans, too many Canadians, too much military equipment concentrated in Great Britain. It couldn't be concealed from the Germans. So what the Allies had to do was paint a picture for the Germans. We knew and we were sure that the Allied would land somehow and somewhere. We didn't exactly know where. And Rommel himself, he visited us several times and he insisted the invasion could come to Normandy, so we had to be very careful. The Allies go to great lengths to convince the Germans that invasion will come at the narrowest part of the English Channel, known as the Pas de Calais. The embarkation points from then on around Kent were made so as to give the Germans the idea that we were going to come the shortest way to Dover. The Allies undertake a huge military build-up on the east coast of England. But this is just a ploy, and not all is what it appears to be. They could in inflate them in a few minutes. Absolutely full-sized ones with guns and everything. An air raid warning had come, and one young Canadian soldier lay flat by the side of one of these tanks. The whole thing collapsed on him. He gave a scream, and I never seen a man run so fast out of the field. <laughs> Much to our joy. The Allies created entire fake armies under command of the very flamboyant General George Patton and said that they were in East Anglia, near the Pas de Calais, far from Normandy, and that convinces the Germans, when they fly over and see these uh, fake tanks and think they're real, that that's where the invasion is going to come from. The Allies reinforce this visual deception with fake signals and radio traffic, all designed to convince the Germans that Calais is the target. Berlin, Germany, 1943. Hitler knows an Allied invasion is coming, but isn't sure where. He turns to his trusted general, Erwin Rommel, to bolster the defences along the Atlantic Wall. The Germans uh, did fortify France, the famous Atlantic Wall, from 42 onwards. There was uh, an order from Hitler saying we have to build uh, 15,000 bunkers. I mean, the big problem was you had, the Germans had, I don't all know, I think 5,000 kilometers of coastline from southern France uh, to northern Norway. And um, a big step was then that Rommel came to France in, in November 43, and he gave the whole construction program a big push. There are more Germans than ever along the coastline, where they are busy reinforcing the network of blockhouses. They have requisitioned local civilians to speed up the building process. They are having anti-tank ditches and trenches dug, and concrete slabs for cannons poured just about everywhere in the fields. They are expecting something to happen. The Atlantic Wall was particularly strong in the part of Calais. 
area, so, so from Boulogne to Dunkirk, because the Germans expected that um, the, the British and Allied attack must come there. Rommel's briefed at his headquarters in France. He's told a landing will come at Calais, but an invasion soon is extremely unlikely, not least because the weather's poor and German forecasters don't anticipate a break. So Rommel heads home to Germany to celebrate his wife's 50th birthday. It was very important to paint a picture for the Germans that was understandable, expected, plausible, and the Germans fell for it. Portsmouth, England, June the 5th, 1944. With the Germans completely hoodwinked, the Allies are ready to launch Operation Overlord. But the weather intervenes. One of the most important things was getting the weather right. You couldn't invade in stormy weather. You know, you wouldn't be able to get onto the beach. You wouldn't be able to keep supplying people with the necessary food, ammunition, petrol, and so on. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower has already delayed the invasion one day. Now he's in danger of missing the window of opportunity provided by a favorable tide. Delaying for another month would be disastrous. It means an anxious wait for the troops. I remember on the eve of D-Day, uh, seeing all these tank landing craft uh, wallowing around in the sea, and the soldiers were all uh, being seasick, and I thought, how on earth? They're supposed to land on the beach and then go into action straight away. I'll never know. That was the time you got frightened, waiting and everything else. Sitting there waiting to go in, you was nervous. Everybody was. No, no man can tell me he wasn't right. Eisenhower asks the forecaster, will there be a break in the weather? Can we invade tomorrow? Well, the forecaster said, well, you said, um, I, I, I'll tell you, I think it'll be better. He couldn't say it was going to be good, but he, he thought it would be better. Eisenhower said, OK, let's go. We'll do it. I take responsibility if it all goes wrong. We were ready to go, but we was waiting for the order. Then all of a sudden, it stopped raining, and it came over, go. June the 6th, 1944. When daylight came on the 6th, I mean, I could look back, and there was a, this mass of shipping. One just looked and one couldn't believe the size of the operation. I looked and there was the channel, full of boats, all coming in one direction. And the skipper said, look, boys, we're making history. This is D-Day. When the Allied fleet emerged out of the morning mist on the coast of, of Normandy. The defenders were shocked, because they, they had not expected anything on quite this scale. There were just ships you could see right across the, the channel. There seemed to be an endless uh, flow of, of ships. We, we didn't expect the invasion in uh, Normandy, because the distance was very long. There were a lot of cliffs, difficult to overcome. Roma repeated, if the Allied will land, and we can't throw them back into the sea within 24 hours, that will be the beginning of the end. 7,000 ships, including destroyers and battleships, approach the French shoreline. Amphibious landings will be made on five beaches in Normandy. British and Canadian forces will assault three beaches, codenamed Gold, Juno and Sword. The Americans will take two beaches further west, codenamed Omaha and Utah. It was surprising, really. It was fairly quiet as where we were going, because as we got nearer, then all hell blew loose. Allied ships and aircraft bombard the coastal defences, blasting away at German dugouts and pillboxes. Suddenly, we see an extraordinary blaze. 
the horizon where the sea is lights up as if from the reflection of an enormous fire burning on the ocean, the formidable pounding of naval gunfire. And you've never seen anything like it in all your life. You've got these 18 inch guns firing, you've got the rockets firing, and you've got the big guns blasting the beaches to bits. The Germans return fire and unleash their own artillery. German artillery began to find her range and at least 25 88 millimeter shells found her mark. The 88s exploded into forward troop of forward and practically killed everybody there. Our naval barrage swept the enemy beaches with brooms of fire. And by dawn, the smaller landing craft were in the water, ready to take on their cargoes of infantry. It was uh, just a harrowing, harrowing experience. Uh, and I thought I was going to die being transferred to the smaller ship. Because if you didn't time yourself getting off that rope ladder, you would be crushed right then and there. And what a horrible thought get crushed without even getting ashore. Well, it must have been incredibly intense because they knew this was going to be the great invasion that would liberate Europe and end the war. And that's, of course, what they wanted above all, the war to be over and for them to be able to get back to their normal lives. Uh, and yet they knew that it was going to be a terrible ordeal, that they might not survive it. So, you know, one can easily imagine the, the conflicting emotions of thinking, this is the most important thing I'm ever going to do, but maybe I won't see the end of it. And many of them didn't. I was afraid. I was afraid. Uh, the unknown is uh, what uh, brings us fear. Fear of the unknown. I think everybody had got fear. But there was always one, there's always one amongst you who will be cracking jokes and keep your spirits up. You don't want to let your mates down. Some people just couldn't cope with it. Fear's a thing that I couldn't describe to you. You shake a wee bit. Your knees do knock a bit. But you know you've got to do it. Huddled in landing craft, the Allied troops prepare to storm the beaches. You're in these landing craft, so you're very vulnerable. You're, you're, you're going across the water, laden down with a big pack and with your ammunition and your rifle and so on. You're being shot at. There's nothing you can do to defend yourself. You're going very slowly towards the beach. You know, it must have been terrifying. And also, everybody's keyed up. As soon as the ramp goes down, then you rush. You rush for the beach. And concentrated on the ramps where the troops were coming down and the ramps were, were blown. It made it impossible for the troops to get past the pile of dead and the wounded at the foot of the ramps. As we were running in, then we were coming into fire. Everything was opening up on you. It was just hellish. The German snipers stopped up and they were fantastic marksmen. And they could hit Penny, I should think, from 500 yards. Then we were dead in the water, we were floating about, and you had to go over the top of them. It's the thing that nightmares are composed of. Many of the landing craft hit sandbars and have to offload too early. Tanks drive forward into water that's too deep. Men laden with heavy equipment sink and drown. There are scenes of complete carnage. Debris all over, tanks, lorries, you name it, it was there blown up, burnt out in bits and pieces. At Omaha Beach, the bombardment has failed to destroy the German defences. So for machine gunners positioned in the high cliffs, it's open season. I had 12,000 rounds for my machine gun. I started shooting at 5 a.m. and I was still shooting nearly nine hours later. At first, corpses were 500 meters away, then 400, then 150. There was blood everywhere screams of the dead and dying. I was the first one out. The seventh man was the next one to get across the beach without being hit. All the ones in between were hit. Two were killed, three were injured. That's how lucky you had to be. Rommel receives the shocking news, but he's at home in Germany, hundreds of miles away. When Hitler finally awakens at the Berghof, he welcomes the news. It's as if a weight has been lifted from his shoulders.
but he's still convinced that it's all a cover for the real invasion to come. We were alerted at uh, four in the morning. We start moving to north. We had the order to stop because our headquarter was not sure it is a real invasion or only a diversion. Without reinforcements, the German army along the Normandy coast is overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of Allied infantrymen. In the end, uh, Rommel lost out. They didn't have all their forces focused there. Uh, they were divided. It took time, in fact, to, to redeploy those reserves effectively. And that was time lost. That was time which the Allies managed to get a, a real foothold uh, on the French coast. As the Allied troops continue to come ashore, the sheer scale of the casualties becomes clear. There were a lot of our own uh, dead lying around on the beach. There was this horrible stench of death. I'd never before seen a dead person. The whole place was littered. You know, that hit me. I then knew, you know, what was ahead of me. But this is only the beginning. The Allies need to advance inland quickly before the Wehrmacht is able to reinforce the coastline. And Hitler already has a plan for a counterattack designed to throw the Allies back into the sea. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe, made in conjunction with our great Russian allies. I have this message for all of you. Although the initial assault may not have been made in your own country, the hour of your liberation is approaching. All patriots Men and women, young and old, have a part to play in the achievement of final victory. To members of resistance movements, whether led by nationals or by outside leaders, I say, follow the instructions you have received. Wait until I give you the signal to rise and strike the enemy. For many French people, this is the first they hear of the Allied invasion. Others, though, are already well aware. Everyone in the village has now gone out into the street to welcome the paratroopers. And we are already celebrating D-Day by inviting all the Americans to stop by for a drink. People burst out laughing and cry, oh and ah, at the sight of new, startling things, such as one of the first jeeps, which has descended from the sky in a glider. Parachuters and gliders have been dropping behind enemy lines throughout the night. In total, 18,000 men parachute in to work with the resistance to disrupt German reinforcements. We welcome them with open arms. We already consider ourselves liberated, as if the German army had vanished overnight. It was a moment of euphoria. For millions of people across France, the news brings fresh hope and renewed fighting spirit. Once D-Day was announced, there was a call for national insurrection, for people to rise up and, and join the efforts of the resistance. News of the resistance movement in the cities occasionally arrives, but for obvious reasons, pictures are rare. Therefore, this scene is of particular interest. It shows the havoc caused at Grenoble when the German artillery park, with 150 tons of explosives and a great mass of ordnance, was blown up by French patriots. The Allies had to create the conditions for a successful invasion, and that meant smashing the Germans in depth throughout central France so that the Germans would not be able to briskly respond and throw the invaders back into the sea. The resistance takes the fight straight to the German divisions moving towards Normandy. The second SS Panzer Division, known as Das Reich, one of Hitler's elite armoured units is one of the main resistance targets. There was ambushing the Germans. They blew up bridges in front of the uh, Das Reich advance. Up to about seven a day, I remember. It was a very hectic days. Das Reich 
faces constant ambush by resistance guerrilla fighters. Meanwhile, Britain's elite Special Air Service, the SAS, strikes at other panzer divisions across France. Groups of the Special Air Service in uniform were landing, parachuting into France with jeeps. And in something that was called Operation Bull Basket, they were driving through central France openly, smashing German railway lines and making it difficult for the Germans to respond to the invasion once it started. Das Reich is badly delayed. What should be a three-day march to Normandy actually takes them two weeks. When they arrive, they're a battered and depleted force. All of this gives the Allied forces the edge they need on the Normandy coast. Normandy, France, June the 12th, 1944. Five beachheads are consolidated into a single front. The Allies push on towards the strategically vital town of Caen, but they face fierce German resistance in terrain perfectly suited to defense. The hedgerows went around every farmer's farm. They got up to seven, eight feet. So if you advanced, you had to go over the hedgerow, then move on to the next one. The Germans dug holes in the corner of them fields. When we came in, they said hello. The infantry is forced to dig trenches for protection. Well, then what happens in Normandy is a World War I-style battle of attrition. 60% um, of the British infantry involved were casualties, which is as high as any First World War battle. Um, they're fighting their way through this heavily defended countryside of banks and ditches and so on uh, against a very battle-hardened and very determined German enemy. We were sitting in these trenches um, morning, noon and night. Uh, we were being mortared and shelled and uh, every day you'd hear somebody had popped it, somebody had been killed. The whole time we were down in the, this area, there was always a worry that he might suddenly be killed. It is a tremendous strain. With the German army deeply entrenched in the city of Caen, General Montgomery turns to air power to break the stalemate. I think the 450 heavy bombers are about 10 o'clock at night, still light. And we had an absolute grandstand view and an uh, um, incredible sight. Two months after D-Day, Allied soldiers finally occupy the city. But not everyone is happy to see them. When we saw the first Canadian arrive to liberate us, of course, it was joy all round. I remember he arrived by himself. And there was a woman who had lost everything in the bombing. When she saw him, she did not welcome him at all, as in her eyes it was his fault. She had lost everything when the town was bombed. The bombing caused widespread destruction. Our house had been destroyed. Where my parents lived had been destroyed. Without a doubt, there were victims in the rubble. The morgue was full and the bodies started to decompose. We made a communal grave in the garden of the hospital. I continued to help people. I thought it was my duty amidst so much sadness. Adding to the fury of the locals, the Germans have already withdrawn. The bombing of Caen has left a very mixed memory for locals who feel that the bombardment that took place bore no relation to the needs of the occasion. Some have even referred to it as a war crime. The Allies have won the Battle of Normandy, and people celebrate. But the Allied occupation is not without its problems. The arrival of the Allies in Normandy, the reality of the American forces living side by side with those French civilian populations, was not all one might expect. Initially, they were received by euphoric clouds who were thrilled uh, at their liberation. For some French people, the presence of the uh, Americans became quite oppressive. Some of the American soldiers looked to the French women for sexual adventures, some of which were consensual, 
many of which were the less so. The greatest shock was the discovery of unbridled sexual ways and in brutal forms. There were rapes and aggressions. With assault troops billeted and moving about everywhere, it was imprudent for a woman or a girl to go out on her own. Nazi occupation is coming to an end, but France is once again a war zone. Law and order collapses as four years of pent-up anger and mistrust are unleashed. Resistors have been living alongside collaborators. Now they look to settle old scores. The population turned on its own, looking for those it could blame and scapegoat, those who'd taken the wrong side, many of those who perhaps might even have uh, got something that they wanted to hide, would point out those who'd done wrong. And many of those who were pulled out into the population were those women who might have spent time with the Germans, who might have had a relationship with a German, and these women were brought into public places, squares, and their heads were shaved. Sometimes swastikas were painted on them. Sometimes they were even beaten up or, or raped even, in order to show the population that those who collaborated should pay. The whole crowd cheering, catcalling as they had their hair cut off. Now that was the other side, the, um, the all this retaliation against obesity prostitutes. You had to see where the people protested, where they all that guiltless of collaboration. Who were those who'd taken the sides of Germans? Who were those who were guilty of having been on the wrong side? Some of these young Makisar, these FFI fighters who had found themselves in a position of power now, sought out the perpetrators. And very quickly, we see what we tend to call the purges, the, the kind of wild purges, when the population took control. We learned that the Jewish gentleman my mother knew had really been a collaborator. And during the liberation, as part of the purges, members of the resistance forced him to dig his own grave, and he was killed. His wife and children were deported and never came back. In the absence of government and authority, people take the law into their own hands. Collaborators are convicted without trial. There are summary executions throughout the country. Unless order is quickly restored, France is in danger of descending into civil war. Paris, France. August the 15th, 1944. As the Allied armies advance towards the capital, the police go on strike. The FFI set up headquarters in the sewers, and posters appear all over town calling for popular insurrection. In Paris plans were set up, you know, what can we do, how can we liberate the city so that, you know, it's been liberated by, by the French and not by the Allies. And as the Allies approached, the resistance finally chose the moment. The Gestapo flees the city as barricades invoking the French Revolution appear all over town. French police form a battle unit and Parisians take up arms. We knew that the British and Americans were arriving near Paris. Our friend had some arms hidden underneath the floorboards. He had shown us all the machine guns that he had been able to get. Paris, on the surface, was evidently still firmly held by the Bosch. Then, as zero hour, the hour to strike approached, the streets became empty and ominously quiet. The hush before the storm. Then the storm broke. And now at last, before the arrival of help from outside, the people of the city rose to wipe out this humiliation. Resistors openly attack German units as fighting breaks out on the city streets. The Allied armies are still nowhere to be seen as the battle for Paris begins. Eisenhower wants to bypass Paris to maintain pressure on the German retreat. But de Gaulle takes matters into his own hands. He orders French divisions straight into the capital. Eisenhower is compelled to send units in support. In response, Adolf Hitler 
finally betrays his lifelong love of French architecture. In a spirit of revenge, Hitler demanded that Paris be destroyed. He did not want to yield up Paris undamaged to the French. But Hitler's commander in Paris disobeys the order and withdraws. As de Gaulle and the Allies move through the outskirts of Paris, they're greeted with scenes of joy and jubilation. Streets were lined with cheering people, a massive crowd, charring you with them and all sorts of things. This is history in the making. A huge feeling of anticipation. But as they approach the city centre, it's obvious that the battle for Paris is not yet over. The weird kind of thing coming from all this carnival atmosphere to the sound of machine gun fire and absolute deserted squares and people that are in the windows of the houses and people scuttling along and that sort of thing and the fighting was going on. Pockets of German resistance remain. The occasional German sniper decides to stay behind and fight to the last breath. But the French resistance has already established almost total control of the city. With the outcome clear, Parisians now hurry to demonstrate their allegiance to the liberators. Oh, everybody came out and we waved and we shouted and, uh, and we spent our day with the troops as they were coming by. And of course, some who had been collaborators came to cheer them. And uh, when I saw one of the well-known lawyers who had shouted in the trains, I remember saying, we'll throw the British in the sea. They'll never come to our country. We'll throw them out. So when I saw him coming to see them, I said to the French troops, he wanted you to be chucked out in the, in the sea. He was a collaborator. But accusations come thick and fast. Some collaborators, desperate to cover their own actions, point the finger. There are wild purges throughout the city. De Gaulle, however, seizes control. He sets up provisional government and courts to bring collaborators to trial. The wild purges are replaced by legal purges. There are executions. Marshal Pétain is spared, but banished to life imprisonment on an island off the coast of France. D-Day is the beginning of the end for Hitler's conquest of France. The German army retreats towards the fatherland, which it will defend at any cost. As the Allies get closer to Berlin, they witness for themselves the true horrors of the Nazi regime. The Red Army, enraged by what they've seen, are intent on bloody revenge. Hitler's downfall is inevitable, yet victory will not be complete until Berlin itself is reduced to ruins and soaked in blood.